you're good. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's kind of an unusual Sunday morning for us, uh, uh, unique in, in practically every respect. Um, we are coming to you uh, live streaming uh, with an empty sanctuary. As probably some of you know, uh, and we will be getting word out uh, over the course of the next few days. Uh, the church recently has decided to reclose due to the resurgence of the COVID-19 um, virus. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, again, we are always going to err on the side of caution, err on the side of people being safe. Uh, and then to the extent that we can contribute to that, uh, we will do so uh, as often as we can. Uh, I do want to thank uh, some folks uh, last week. Well, before, actually, before I do that, uh, I do want to say thank you to the task force uh, for uh, making it making a, a, a difficult decision for taking on that task. Uh, so I'm, th I'm thankful to them. Uh, and, and as I say, we will probably have a letter out to the congregation probably within the next couple of days. Uh, what we are, what we have more or less decided is that, and I don't want to get into a, too much of a, of a uh, but once we are, once uh, Hamilton County is no longer in the red level that Governor DeWine pointed out for two consecutive weeks, uh, that's when we will return. So uh, uh, stand by, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, I, I'd even say complaints, <laughs> uh, by all means, about the office down there. We will do the best we can to let everybody know and keep everyone in the loop. So, uh, you know, check with uh, our Facebook page, uh, call me, call the, well, yeah, call the office, uh, and we will, we will do the best we can to let people know what's happening on a week by week basis. Uh, but as I started to say, I do want to thank everyone uh, who came out last week for our uh, church picnic. Uh, it was a pretty good time. Um, the, the weather eventually cooperated. Uh, I want to thank Mary Beth Faberman and the Congregational Life team for planning that uh, and for everyone who helped out once we were there. Um, I especially want to thank Heather uh, uh, and Julie for coming out and playing. Uh, the bell sounded marvelous. Uh, I also wanted to give you an update on the, uh, a sandwich update uh, for our daily bread. As, as you probably know, we've been making sandwiches uh, for a local uh, soup kitchen uh, who's largely had to close. Right now, the count is close to 2,400 sandwiches. Uh, to be exact, at last count, it was 2,366 sandwiches. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of peanut butter, jelly, bologna, and so forth. So, uh, I, I I can't thank our sandwich makers enough. Uh, session will begin their quote unquote regular stated meetings this coming week. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday. Uh, given the fact that we've reclosed, uh, we will probably make it available on Zoom as well as in person. We plan to do it in person, but if you are on session and, and, and listening in right now, watching right now. Uh, we will, we will, I'll make that call on, on Monday and we'll probably be able to do it in mixed fashion. Whoever is comfortable coming can, whoever would prefer to stay home via Zoom, we can do that as well. Uh, some prayer requests, uh, uh, some, some new ones and some ones that we've had on for a while. Uh, I would please pray for Vivian Preppen, our ministry uh, assistance uh, and her family uh, after the death of her father, uh, Dorsey Wright, this past week. Um, also for Dale Hedrick's brother-in-law, Bill Rankin, and his family as he battles cancer. Uh, please pray for Nancy Wars, who uh, broke her arm a couple of weeks ago, and she continues to be on the mend. I've spoken to her, and Nancy seems to be doing just fine. Uh, please continue to pray for Holly Shepherd and her family. Uh, as they grieve the loss of Holly's brother Gary. Also for Susan Greenley and her family as they grieve the tragic loss uh, of, of their three-year-old nephew Oscar. Uh, for Brittany Ulrich and her family after the death of her brother. Uh, and please also pray for Annette Caraca uh, who has developed some health concerns. So all of that, uh, all of that said, um, 
Uh, it is a beautiful day. Uh, it is the day after the 4th of July. Uh, we have uh, we've seen a lot as a nation uh, these past few months, uh, and we have dealt with it, uh, I would say, with varying degrees of success. But nevertheless, uh, we continue uh, to seek God, to seek God's presence, uh, and to beseech God, as the psalmist reminds us, to give us success. So as we pray for our country, our communities, and one another, let's take a moment as we begin our worship. As we begin our worship, hear these words from Holy Scripture. Brothers and sisters, come into this sacred space to worship God, whose teaching is perfect, whose directions are sure. Come into this holy place to worship God, whose standards are right, whose commandments are clear, whose judgments are true. Come with open hearts and open minds to be given life and made wise, to have your hearts stirred up and your eyes opened wide. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory. You invite us to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our nation a zeal for justice and the strength for forbearance that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. We ask this on a day of celebration a day of hope for a nation made free. We ask this in the name of the one who welcomes all to be free indeed. Inspire us to live and worship in your freedom and for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It is in our confession where we realize our desire for God and our hope for God's mercy. It is in admitting the truth of our lives that we take the first step towards wholeness and healing and true freedom. Let us therefore make our confession to God first in the words of the prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may be life in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. The psalmist reminds us that the Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarding us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Brothers and sisters, hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in Jesus Christ we are, we are forgiven, and that truth will set us free. Thanks be to God, and may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you now and always. The Word of God in Holy Scriptures is central to our worship service, and so as we enter into that time where God's Word is read and proclaimed, let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your Word for us, may your Spirit rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, our speaking, our believing, and in our living. In Jesus' name, amen. Two brief readings this morning. The first is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, can be found in chapter 5, which will take the first verse, and then verses 13 and 14. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of the Lord. Our Gospel reading this morning is from chapter 8 of John's Gospel, verses 31 through 36. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the Jews who have, who have uh, come to hear him speak, and our, our, our text indicates that these were Jews who believed in him. And so he's speaking to a group of believers, and I invite you to listen for God's word as believers ourselves. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you truly are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, then you will be free indeed. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning's sermon is kind of a sequel to last week's sermon, though it probably may be more accurate to say that it's something of a continuation. Now yesterday, of course, was the 4th of July, Independence Day. It is our festival of freedom. 
And so there are two quotations that I wish to highlight this morning. The first is from Thomas Jefferson and is the second line of the Declaration of Independence. And I, I have to admit that uh, I, we watched uh, the, the first act of Hamilton last night, so there is a slight temptation to want to deliver this in either a rap or hip-hop style, but I will, I will absolutely spare you all this morning. But the, the quote goes something like this. It said, for we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second quote is from Jesus, and we heard it in this morning's gospel reading. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so what we have before us are two freedoms, political freedom and religious freedom. As I'm fond of offering context, I want to offer some for that first quote from the Declaration of Independence. The date was June 7, 1776. A group of 13 men were gathered together in a small room locked in debate. They represented the 13 different colonies, and there was no unanimity among them. So you can imagine that the debate was heated. Finally, Richard Henry Lee made the motion that all 13 colonies be free independent states. The resolution was seconded by John Adams, but the debate continued. And again, it was by all accounts intense. A vote was finally taken, and believe it or not, it was not unanimous. The vote was 7-4, 6 against. So then a subcommittee was then formed, headed by Jefferson. Now there is no truth to the rumor that they were Presbyterian, thus forming that subcommittee. But in any case, this committee was charged with creating a document that would declare the independence of the colonies. And so it was put before Congress on July 2nd, 1776, and it was immediately ratified by every state except one, except New York who held out for two more days. So on July the 4th, 1776, it was fat finally ratified unanimously. It was then that we heard the first words that became etched to American history. In fact, I would say even to world history and into the hearts and minds of Americans then and since. Begin with the words from the first quote. Again, as we heard, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But interestingly, it continued. It says, we, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. In other words, what's happening here is that the authors of this document appealed to God as the authority that gave them the right to pursue political freedom. That last line of the Declaration of Independence is also quite memorable. It says, with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And of course, they did. Everyone who signed the Declaration lost something, and not something small, because of it. Of the 56 people who signed the Declaration that day, more than half suffered deeply because of their commitment to independence. Two were killed immediately in battle, five were soon captured and tortured by the British, 12 had their homes burned, nine others died of hardship related to the war. But we're not only impressed with their integrity and with their sacrifice, we're also impressed by their deep commitment to God and to the ideals of Christianity. Now, regarding the specific religious beliefs of the Founding Fathers, as you probably know, there's been a lot written about that particular subject, whether they were Christian, whether they were deists, as some have said, 
uh, or something in between. The way I see it, I think that there can be no doubt that the founding of our democracy was born in the hearts and minds of religious men. Take John Adams, for example, our second president. He wrote these following words to his wife Abigail. He wrote, the 2nd of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epic in the history of America. I am led to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations on every anniversary festival. It ought to be a commemoration at the day of deliverance with solemn acts of devotion to God. So, yesterday, even in a time of pandemic, we celebrated. And I know we celebrated because I heard fireworks going off everywhere in our neighborhood. But I have to wonder, even as we, and perhaps as we gathered in small groups to, to cook out or, or to, to just celebrate in some other way, I have to wonder if we spent any time at all asking God for our, thanking God, I should say, for our freedoms, the ones that we so easily take for granted, the ones that came at such high a cost. I, I wish I knew. I wish I could say that more people thank God for that. But it wasn't only John Adams, uh, he wasn't the only founder, who was a man of faith. A large majority of the founding fathers were men of faith. William uh, Penn actually once said that if we are not ruled by God, we will be ruled by tyrants. So I guess it's kind of ironic that America, founded in no small part on religious ideals, has in this day and age seemed to become a secular nation. I say ironic because central to the American ideal of democracy, at its very source, at its very beginning, was a deeply held religious conviction. Now, not that I would at all be in favor of a theocracy, uh, certainly not like the one we've seen in some of the Middle East countries and which we've seen throughout history. A theocracy is something, uh, is a place where, where religion rules where religion has sway. But I get it that there is something of a fine line here, that, that separation of church and state. But I tend to agree with President Dwight Eisenhower, who believed that democracy works best when it is built on a foundation of religious idealism. He once said, quote, our government has no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith. And, of course, it was Ike that pushed to have the phrase, under God, inserted in the Pledge of Allegiance. And it was Ike that signed the bill that made, in God we trust, our nation's official motto. Now, again, I, I understand the need for a separation of church and state. I get that. I truly do. And there's a reason why the First Amendment reads, at least in part, as follows. That Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But it's also hard to ignore the psalmist who wrote, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's verse 12. Democracy, as it has been said, is hard. As a, a, a movie, The American President once said, Democracy is hard. You gotta want it bad because it's gonna put up a fight. The Declaration of, the, uh, of Independence is by no means an easy document. Nevertheless, its words have been etched into the very soul of this nation. They've been described, these words, as a democracy in a nutshell. Now, not surprisingly, their meaning has been interpreted and reinterpreted in every succeeding generation since they were first written. And it was nearly a century later that Abraham Lincoln wrote about a need for a rebirth of freedom in every generation. Now these words echoed those immortalized in his Gettysburg Address that was in the wake of a battle that had been fought on the 4th of July. But Lincoln, as he often was, was quite correct. Every generation must apply the principles of freedom in a new way, and right, wrong, or indifferent, that has happened. Not only that, the idea and ideal of freedom has continued to spread in new ways in each and every generation, even beyond the bounds of these United States. Historian Henry Steele's commentary and a commentary 
on the Declaration of Independence, wrote this. He said, these ideals of freedom are not confined to America, but they entered into the mainstream of history on every continent. The ideal that all people, men, women, black, white, all are created equal. What a grand dream. What an amazing spirit-filled vision our forefathers had. But we tend to think of this kind of freedom in a purely political sense. And as we're all well aware, the freedoms that we enjoy here in the United States are not experienced everywhere. And so in the context of worship this morning, we celebrate another, I would offer an even greater kind of freedom, which brings us back to our second quote. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, it may have occurred to you that Jesus isn't talking about political freedom. He's talking about personal freedom, Christian freedom, in my opinion, true freedom. But what exactly are we talking about here? What does it mean to be free in Christ? What is it to be free if you're in prison? What if you live in a dictatorship, especially a religious one? One Christian scholar offers this definition, saying that to be free in Christ is to be the kind of person that we are intended to be. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? That freedom is in being the kind of person we're intended to be. The implication there is that we're to be what or who someone else wants us to be. Shouldn't we be free to be the people that we want to be? I mean, you think so. But for those of you who believe that, let me ask this. How's that working for you? You see, and this is important, true freedom isn't being about who we want to be or about doing whatever we want. And honest, would we really want it to be? I mean, think about that for a moment, seriously. How often are we ourselves, more, though more likely than others, uh, victims of our own freedom when we make bad choices? So many think of the Christian faith, the Christian life, in terms of, of legalism. You know what I mean? A, a bunch of rules that we have to obey. For a long time, I thought that myself. But Christian freedom, I, I think much like any other freedom, comes with responsibilities. As citizens in a democracy, we must be responsible for our actions. We have freedom, we have rights, absolutely. But, and I cannot state this strongly enough, we have responsibilities too. And the same is true as citizens in God's kingdom. We must participate. We must remain committed. And we must remain civil. There is nothing, however, passive about this. Believe it or not, Paul told the Thessalonians, second letter, chapter 3, verse 10, believe this or not, that if you don't work, you don't eat. But you'll notice I've said nothing about obeying laws. You might ask, well, what about the Ten Commandments? My response to be, well, the truth is that obeying God isn't so much about keeping commandments as it is about recognizing the boundaries that they establish and protect. And that's because, you see, boundaries exist between people, between nations, and they are for our safety and our protection to allow for people to have some degree of control over their lives. And as I read scripture, <clears throat> boundaries are fundamental to the act of creation. Boundaries were among the first things that God created. The, the boundaries between light and darkness, sea and sky, sea and land. And as for human beings, God created us to be free, but to act responsibly. 
From the very beginning, God wanted us to be in control of ourselves and to live happy lives, or at least allow for the pursuit of happiness. But there were still boundaries. There will always be boundaries. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, understood that we needed them. But as we all know, we misused our freedom and as a result lost it. And the biggest part of this loss of freedom is the loss of self-control. And ever since, we felt the results of that loss in a wide variety of ways that have brought humankind nothing but misery. Boundaries are something so dear, so near to God's heart that it was one of the motivators of Christ's sacrifice. Earlier we read from Paul's letter to the Galatians, we read, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Jesus died to set us free. Free from sin. Freedom from the world around us. Freedom from death. And that's what boundaries are all about. Freedom. And brothers and sisters, here's the thing. From the cross, almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus cried out, It is accomplished. Ever wonder what was accomplished? Well, when Jesus cried out, It is accomplished, he proclaimed our declaration of independence. He set us free, commanding us to love God and neighbor. It is our responsibility, our joyful response to an incredible act of love. Loving God and loving neighbor is that response. So let me ask you, does this sound like something to which we can pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor? I'd say so. But there's more. Quite frankly, it's the best part, which, which I, which, what I mean to say is that this is the ultimate freedom that is to come. It will come, it will happen when Christ returns. Then, as Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the, bounder, from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. I don't know, call me crazy, but I think that's definitely something worth waiting for, definitely something worth celebrating. Until then, let us be thankful to God for our freedom as a country, one nation under God, as the church, children of God, called, created, and free by God. Amen and amen. Typically, this would be a time of offertory, where we would um, instruct folks who uh, are present in the sanctuary to place their, their uh, uh, offerings in the collection plate that stands just outside of the narthex. Um, obviously, we're not going to do that today. There really is, well, I won't say there's no one here. There are people here. Uh, but we will not be taking up an offering, obviously. Nevertheless, I want to pray for stewardship, a prayer that... The work of the church, God's work here in Westwood and around the world would continue to be supported. Let us pray. Father, when we offer our treasure and our hearts to you, we ask that they may be used to pass on the promise of hope, peace, life, and community to all in need of the, your presence in their lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. more, let us pray for God's people according to their needs. Gracious God, you have promised that if your people, those who were called by your name, would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And so, God of the ages, hear us 
as we offer our prayers this day. Hear us as we offer our prayers for our world and all its peoples, for all who lead and hold authority throughout the world, that they may lead in peace and justice. For our country, that all Americans, we may hold fast to our ideals and be a light to other nations. For our military, for police, firemen, EMTs, medical workers on the front line of the pandemic and all who serve in harm's way, we pray for your blanket of protection over them and their families. We pray for ourselves, for one another, for our family and friends, and all in need of healing, rest, or comfort, whether in body, mind, or spirit. For those saints who have entered into joy, may we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. For your church, for pastors, elders, deacons, trustees, all who lead and serve the body of Christ in all places. Guide us through uncertain times in our anxiety and our fear. Teach us to listen for your still, small voice. Send your spirit that we might have the courage, wisdom, patience, and strength that we need to be the people, the church, that you have created and called us to be. Hold especially close to you all those who cannot worship freely or suffer persecution for the gospel's sake wherever they may be. And now, Father, we ask that you would please hear the prayers that we raise to you this day, both aloud and in silence. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is sadness, joy. The Divine Master grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us to pray, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you.
As we close our service, uh, I want to say a, a very big thank you uh, to Dylan Drake and Heather McPhail. Uh, Governor first for being here and playing so amazingly well, Heather, excellent as always. Um, and thank you for being so flexible. Uh, a lot of this, a lot of this change and turmoil that was last minute, so we really, really appreciate uh, the flexibility of being here uh, today. Also, I, I meant to say this at the beginning of the service, but some of you may have noticed I have a new stole. Um, it, was a, uh, it, was, it was a graduation present, and it was uh, made by a couple of people, um, one who is uh, absolutely near and dear to my heart, uh, my sister, uh, my sister Cammy. Uh, she actually did the, um, I guess the needle point or whatever that, I, I, not very artsy, but I don't know what this is. But she did make this, uh, and she knows that I love a Frank Lloyd Wright design, so she made this, and the, the stole was finished uh, by uh, a friend, of, a mutual friend, uh, uh, although someone I haven't seen in a long time, uh, Sarah Thompson. So thank you, Candy. Thank you, Sarah. Love you both. Uh, and thank you for this wonderful new soul. Um, I will wear it and think of both of you. Um, it, it probably goes without saying that there has been uh, a great deal of turmoil uh, in these United States. Uh, I would say these last couple of months, but quite frankly, it's been going on a lot longer than that. Um, and, and there are a lot of people talking about rights, um, and probably, and, well, not probably, and, and rightly so. Um, there has been, uh, you know, justice denied to so many for so long now that I think it's time that we, uh, that we begin to move forward and, and with listening ears and open hearts, uh, find out ways that we can restore justice. Uh, and so that justice would, would uh, would continue to prevail in this country and that righteousness would flow uh, down like waters. I think as people who are free, as people who have been freed by, by Jesus Christ, I think it's important for us uh, to, to lead in this. Um, and, 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 and to be at the very forefront uh, of, of all the things that are going on and to, to be there to broker peace, to, to offer uh, a, a responsible word and, to, and certainly to help bring brothers and sisters, neighbors, uh, folks of different stripes, colors, and what have you, uh, bring us to bring people together. I think that's, that is our calling times like these. Um, and so as people who are free for freedom's sake, let us take that responsibility uh, and help to make others free as well. And so may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen.